that and again it'll go green.
Good morning, everyone. Please turn off your pager um, and cell phones or in a silent mode. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Mark Young. He's a, uh, a program director for gastroenterology in the Department of Internal Medicine. He's going to talk about colon cancer detection and prevention. Thank you. Dr. Geraci and the Department of Internal Medicine for um, allowing me to uh, lecture today. Uh, today's actually gastroenterology day. Dr. Goinka and Dr. Reddy and other attendings are coming over and we have you locked up for most of the morning to teach as much gastroenterology as possible. Um, I appreciate your time and I'll try to give you some points to take back to the clinic today that you can use immediately in your uh, patient care. I have no disclosures. The objectives of thank you. The objectives of today's uh, um, lecture are to uh, identify patients that are average versus uh, high risk for developing colon polyps and colonic malignancy. Now this may seem like a very easy um, concept to understand, but uh, our fellows that left last year, Dr. Salim and Dr. Khanna, and one's in Florida, one's at Cedar sinai we were talking about three months ago, and, and there really is a lot of confusion over who, to, who, who falls into these two categories, so we're going to review that. We're going to utilize uh, present tools we have for the detection of colon polyps and colon cancer, and um, uh, we're going to discuss why there's differences on the way that we do things maybe in a university practice and the way that they do things at the VA. We're going to differentiate different histologic types of polyps and go over the new guidelines for follow-up on these polyps. And we're also going to identify potential pitfalls in screening. Uh, you know, why do some patients, when we used to tell patients that if we do a colonoscopy, you have 10 years uh, not to worry about anything, but sometimes interval cancers develop. And then we're going to also try to apply a few preventative measures besides just endoscopy on trying to, to uh, curtail a patient from having colon cancer. This room, about one out of every three individuals at some time in their lifetime, unfortunately will develop a malignancy. And out of those malignancies, uh, Colon cancer is the third most common colon malignancy in men and women, and it's the second leading cause of death in the United States from malignancy. Uh, the instance of colon cancer is actually decreasing in men, over 50, men and women over 50 years old, but there's actually been an increase in uh, younger people. And this is data uh, obtained from the SEER study, uh, from the oncologic data that was just presented and what it did was it looked at about 400,000 patients between 1975 and 2010 that had colon cancer. And you can see that there was a decreasing rate by almost 1% of those after age 50, but people that were age 35 to 49 had an increase of 0.41%. And actually patients ages 20 to 34 had an increase of almost 2%. And I know if you went around the room today and asked people if they had any interactions with people that were younger in their 30s, what I consider younger, in their 30s and 40s that had colon polyps or colon cancer, I bet everyone in this room could probably tell a sad tale of uh, someone developing colon cancer at an earlier age. Now, what are the causes or what do we postulate the causes are? individuals this young developing colon cancer. Well, you know, we, we know that we do have better screening measures now for patients over 50 years old. So there has been a decrease, which is probably related to more colonoscopies being performed. There was a recent study looking at Swedish adults, and the Swedes have a very good registry for tumors. 
And what they did was they took all the Swedish adults that had colonic malignancy and they traced their BMIs back to when they were adolescents. And what they found was that adults had a higher increased risk of colon cancer that were, had higher BMIs when they were teenagers. So Swedish teenagers that were obese had a higher risk of colon polyps greater than a centimeter and also colon malignancy. We've also known for quite a long time that physical inactivity is a risk factor for colon malignancy. And diets high in fat, diets high in red meat, and diets low in fiber are all risk factors for colon polyps and risk factors for colon cancer. Now, we also know that the earlier a tumor can be detected, the better the results. If we can get a patient over to Dr. Krishnan or Dr. Flores Gare, one of the surgeons earlier, they do much better. If you have a tumor that's confined to the bowel wall, the survival rate is about 90%. Regional lymph node metastasis, the survival rate is about 68%. And if you have distant metastasis, the survival rate is only 10%, which is a marked improvement from when I was in medical school, because if you had distant metastasis when I was in medical school, basically no one survived. These mortality reductions are probably an indication of earlier detection of invasive disease with more endoscopy being performed removal of adenomatous polyps with prevention of the, the cycle to malignancy. E having said this, the majority of the U.S. adults are not receiving appropriate screening measures. Uh, we do the best we can. The internists, especially in the local practices, do a very good job of offering all types of screenings to patients when they are at their office visits, but oftentimes patients decline. I think the only shortcoming that we have is that when patients do decline a colonoscopy, is it almost ought to be like you're at a restaurant where if you say, I don't you know, want the filet done well, well, what about if you wanted it done medium well or if you, you wanted it done side? So if a patient says, I don't want a colonoscopy, you could easily say, what about a fit card or what about a flex sig or what about something else? There was a real good symposium by SVMIC about negotiating outcomes with patients about a month ago, and, and that was something that was stressed is, you know, maybe there can be a compromise in the middle. Now, having said that the majority of U.S. adults don't receive appropriate screening, there's been multiple uh, publications in the last two years that we oftentimes overscreen the wrong population. So uh, the current guidelines would suggest that at age 75 that we stop routine surveillance on patients for uh, colonic malignancy unless they're hemocult positive or anemic or have some reason to do that. But what these studies have shown in multiple papers is that we do way too many screening colonoscopies on elderly adults. And this also fell, fall, fell into the same realm. We start doing these preventative measures for all procedures, basically PSAs, everything else, way, way past the time that we, we should probably be, be doing this. The other unfortunate thing is if you look at the screening guidelines, which were updated in 2012, gastroenterologists do an extremely poor job following these guidelines. And I don't think this is for any reason other than they're overly conservative. Um, they're, the biggest fear in gastroenterology is missing a, a, a colonic malignancy. The two biggest reasons a gastroenterologist are sued, one, the use of metoclopramide with extrapyramidal side effects of metoclopramide that haven't been documented in the medical record. And the second most common cause of being sued is, is missing a malignancy. So I think the intentions are good but still the outcomes aren't good because when you do too much endoscopy, this increases the cost of medical care and also older people don't tolerate complications as well as younger people. So the first clinical scenario that we have is a 40-year-old white male presents for a well patient examination. He states his grandmother had colon cancer at age 50. There are no other family members who have colon polyps or colon cancer. Colon cancer screening should start now and every five years, start now and every 10 years, start now and every three years, or we should defer screening until age 50. So a 40-year-old with a family history of a grandmother at age 50 presents for colon cancer screening. Should we start now and every five, start now and every 10, start now and every three, or should we defer screening till age 50? So what defines increased risk and high risk in a patient that presents to your, to your office today. Well, patients who are at increased risk have a history of adenomatous polyps. These adenomatous polyps may be tubular adenomas, villus adenomas, or sessile serrated adenomas. 
Obviously, a patient that has a previous history of colon cancer has what it takes to develop colon polyps and colon cancer again, so they are at increased risk. A family history will, is also an increased risk. A family history of colorectal cancer or an adenomatous polyp in a first degree relative less than age 60 or two first degree relatives at any age or two second degree relatives with colorectal cancer. The final category, which are under screened, are African Americans. We don't understand why African Americans have a higher increased risk of colon polyps and colon cancer, but they do. The American College of Gastroenterology came out probably about seven years ago and recommended that screening ought to be performed for African Americans at age 45 instead of age 50 because they aren't average risk. There are some societies coming out saying that maybe we ought to start screening African Americans at age 40. Who is at high risk? Well, patients that have a genetic diagnosis of familial adenomatous polyposis, patients that have a genetic or clinical diagnosis of hereditary non-polyposis coli, or patients that have chronic ulcerative colitis or chronic Crohn's colitis. So someone that has 10 to 12 years of pancolitis, whether it's due to ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, is at increased risk. And screening ought to start every, two, every year, then every two years, with every 10 centimeter biopsies in four quadrants. A patient that has chronic Crohn's that involves only the small bowel is at no increased risk for colon cancer, and screening ought to fall into the same category as anyone else. So on clinical scenario A, the 40-year-old, whose only family member were, was a grandmother uh, that had colon cancer, we should defer screening until age 50. Now, what if we had said that there was a grandmother and a grandfather? Well, this is two second-degree relatives, and we probably would start screening at age 40, but if, if the exam was negative, we would screen the patient again in 10 years. So a grandparent, a second-degree relative, increases your relative risk of colon polyps and colon malignancy by about 1.2 to 1.8 times the general population but we look at mass screening. So in this room, we're looking at the best way to screen everybody in this room, and the mass screening studies show that that's probably the best way. So now what, what menu do we have? What options do we have to offer our patient when they come into the room, your exam room, and they, 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 they don't come in and say, doctor, I want a colonoscopy. They come in and say, doctor, what are my options for screening for colon cancer? And those options are exfoliated DNA, which we don't use in clinical practice much, and stools for occult blood. There's also structural exams of the colon, including flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, double contrast bearing minima, computerized tomographic colonography. In clinical scenario B, a 60-year-old obese male presents uh, with otherwise average risk, and he declines a screening colonoscopy. He asks what non-invasive cancer detection test, cancer detection test, which requires no bowel prep, that he could be offered. And the choices would be a computerized tomographic colonography, stool fit card, flexible sigmoidoscopy, or double barium contrast x-ray. So he comes to your office, he says he doesn't want a colon. Which of these options would be a non-invasive test that requires no bowel prep? So the current guidelines that we use to discuss uh, the consensus statements are basically from four societies. The first being the American Cancer Society, which was way back in 1980, came up with some guidelines. The U.S. Preventative Task Force was the next society. The American College of Radiology then came out with recommendations. And the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer with our societies has all, have, have also made uh, recommendations. So what are some barriers to screening? Well, lack of health insurance. And I think this, uh, you would agree that in the last four to five years has been a much less common problem. In the last years, Medicare has agreed to cover screening colonoscopy. Blue Cross Blue Shield and most of the private carriers have agreed to cover colonoscopy. So that should not be much of an issue. A lack of physician recommendations, I feel like this has also really decreased with the different awareness programs that we have, and also the lack of awareness of the impact of screening, which I also think is decreasing. So tests that detect adenomatous polyps in cancer 
uh, would be a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years. The gold standard recommended by our societies and the cancer societies are colonoscopy every 10 years. Double contrast barium x-ray every five years has really fallen out of favor and computerized uh, tomographic colonography every five years is also an option. Now, there are also cancer detection tests. Not, and, and these would involve an annual guaiac-based fecal occult blood test, stool DNA test, but the choice for this would be an annual fecal immunochemical test, a FIT test. And this is the choice that the VA has used to screen their veterans for colon malignancy. Now, uh, the attendings uh, in the room and, and some of the house staff, I guess, can remember the stool hemocult cards, and these are still used in some offices. These really should be replaced by stool fit cards. But for the medical students that are just uh, starting practice, what happens is you take this card, you open it up. This is a peroxidase-based based, uh, study. You take the stool from the patient, either on digital rectal or have the patient collect the stool. And if the hemocult is positive, then you have this blue color here that would, that would turn up where you put the stool, and this is a test panel over here. So I can remember uh, many days uh, in the office going to the window outside the fluorescent light, trying to hold the card up to the, the light to see, is this blue or an iron? Is it black or is it blue or is it in between? And there was a lot of subjectiveness in interpreting a hemocult card. So we come up with these kind of weak terms like uh, equivocal or trace positive, and, and, and so it's kind of tough to interpret sometimes. But the positives about the traditional fecal occult blood test is this is really the only colorectal cancer screening test that's been put through prospective randomized studies that has been shown to, in, uh, to uh, increase your survival rates from colon cancer. This requires two samples from three different bowel movements, and you have to avoid aspirin, vitamin C, red meat, and Vegetables. So if you're on um, vitamin C, this can cause a false negative. Obviously, if you're ingesting animal meat and animal products, this can cause a false positive. Over the last years, there was a big, uh, a lot of to do about whether to rehydrate the slide. So do you take the slide, do you put water on it? This increases the sensitivity of the study, but decreases the specificity of the study. So these slides really shouldn't be rehydrated. And the other uh, issue is the studies have shown over the past couple years that the best way to really do this is not to perform a rectal exam in the office and then hemocult the card. The best way to do this is send the patient home, have them collect the stool, and then have the card sent in and then hemocult it in the office. Now, if you have somebody that has a change in bowel habits, is iron deficient, anemic, and you really want to know that day, did they have occult blood in their stool, then I would go ahead and hemocult it in the office. But if it's strictly for preventative purposes, then the stool cards ought to be sent home. Now, fecal occult blood testing, has, I think, should, has been replaced, should be replaced by stool fecal immunochemical testing. And this is the, the, the kit that we use in our, our study. It's the Insure Fit uh, study. And basically, this, um, as you know, this uh, kit detects human globin. It's not a peroxidase test. It, it detects human globin. And the benefits of this, it's more specific for human blood. Uh, there aren't any false positives, with vi false negatives with vitamin C. And the societies have come out and stated that this is a preferred cancer detection test for patients, not stool hemocult cards. There aren't any randomized uh, clinical trials where outcomes are based on colorectal cancer. And most people would, would assume that the adherence is better because you're just collecting one stool instead of three stools. So everyone in their practice really now ought to be using a stool fit card instead of a, a stool hemocult card. There was a lot of excitement about stool DNA about five to eight years ago. And at one point, it was thought that this was probably going to be the main uh, measure to replace uh, colonoscopy. And what this does is it looks at the alterations in the adenoma carcinoma sequence. It looks at 21 separate mutations, including uh, KRAS and the P53, the BAT26. Sensitivity was about 52%, specificity about 97%. There was a question on how often you screen patients with stool DNA cards, and the consensus was about every two years that you probably needed this. Now, 
it, it's, it's a little more expensive. It's, it's not probably as good as some other things. And in clinical practice, it's not used at present. But the investigators are still looking at stool, stool DNA. Flexible sigmoidoscopy has really fallen uh, the usage of this over the past years. When I was in training and early on in my career as an internist, the, the, the recommended screening device was a flexible sigmoidoscopy. And if colon polyps were found, then you went on to full colonoscopy. Uh, it, it has been shown through uh, case control studies that there's a 60 to 80 percent decrease in colorectal cancer. The advantages of it are you're unsedate, unsedated, also it is office-based. So the difference, and again, this is mainly for the medical students, but the difference in colonoscopy and, and flexible sigmoidoscopy is with flexible sigmoidoscopy, you go about 60 centimeters, and you're looking at the sigmoid colon. If you're lucky, you get up to the descending colon. With colonoscopy, you go all the way around the block. You identify the appendicillal orifice and the ileocecal valve, and it's just a more complete study than a flexible sigmoid sigmoidoscopy. Some of the newer uh, things that are coming out is analysis of the gut microbiome, and there's studies looking at improved sensitivity of fecal occult blood by up to 50% if you can analyze the gut microbiome. And it's also been shown that patients that have adenoma and carcinoma also have decreased strains of Clostridium and Bacteroides, so this is something in the future that may be used a little bit more. Barium X-ray has basically become a dinosaur, at least in screening for colon cancer and colon malignancy. It's been replaced by CT colonography by the current cancer screening guidelines if somebody wants an option besides hemocult studies or colonoscopy. There's no randomized con controlled trials evaluating the efficacy as a primary screening tool, and there are several reasons it's fallen out of favor. One is the increased usage of colonoscopy, and the other is most of the younger radiologists coming out of training now really don't have an interest in performing a whole lot of barium studies. At the medical center, Dr. Gibson was like the, uh, uh, the pro of barium studies, and he's retired, and the PA over there now, Eric, is extremely good also. But a lot of places, there aren't that many people doing barium studies. So this is your, like, perfect barium study of your whole lifetime. This is, this is about as good as it gets. And the barium fills out the, uh, the whole colon. And the problem with barium studies is, is they tended to miss a lot of sequel malignancies. And now we're going to talk about, in a minute, uh, sesalcerated adenomas and an increased risk of colon cancer in right-sided uh, individuals. And barium x-ray is very poor for detecting these right-sided flat lesions. CT colonography was all the rage about five to 10 years ago. I remember I was on a run with Hans Vonderfecht, a really good medical student who eventually went into gastroenterology in Miami. And we were going through the tree streets, and he really wanted to do GI. And he was really a smart guy. And he looked at me and said, Dr. Young, I love GI, but are we going to have a job in five to ten years now because CT colonography has come out? Are we going to be doing colonoscopies in the future? And my, my answer to that was, I don't know. You know, they'll still need a colonoscopy if detection of a polyp is found. And also, we do other things. We do the liver and the stomach and other things like that. So I told him not to worry too much. CT colonography is basically virtual colonoscopy. And this is a 2D and 3D image of the colon. It gets down to, to slices of the colon. They're about one to two millimeters. And there's a 94% detection rate with large adenomas. Now, the thing that a lot of patients really don't understand, at least in my practice when they come to see me, is they say, you know, I don't want a bowel prep and I don't want anything invasive, so I want the CT scan that, that tells if I have colon cancer or colon polyps. But there's actually a more aggressive cathartic clean out than with other studies because to, to get out the stool. And also, there's this issue of radiation exposure, which is a hot topic the last few years. And finally, there was a, a pickup of a lot of incidental lesions in the abdomen that had to be worked up with other imaging studies. So it's still an option, but there's, there's not a code that, we, that patients can claim for to have it paid for. I think a virtual colonoscopy or virtual CT is a good option if you have somebody on anticoagulation that doesn't want to bridge and go off their anticoagulation and have a colonoscopy because that is uh, a hassle to, to bridge therapy uh, and stop anticoagulants. Uh, the images are really pretty. You can see here on the uh, left side of the screen in this diagram a small polyp that's being picked up 
and it's really pretty 3D interluminal view of that colon polyp. So it, it's a good study. They don't do them at the medical center. They do them at UT in Knoxville, and also they do them over in Bristol. So if you have a failed colonoscopy um, or someone that just wants another study, that's always an option. Colonoscopy remains the gold standard. There's no prospective randomized controlled trials, for instance, reduction or mortality in colorectal cancer. But with observational cohort and prospective cohort studies, it's been shown to have a decreased colon cancer instance and mortality. Now, the only two slides I have in this deck that are all slides from years ago was this slide. We used to be able to brag to patients and to, and to uh, uh, medical health care that we could stop the sequence from adenoma to carcinoma uh, occurrence. And we can still do this in many patients. But on the left side, on, on this side, you see, you know, a classic uh, pedunculated polyp uh, going into a colon malignancy. And the one, the polyp is probably a villus adenoma because it's on a very nice stalk that can be removed. So we still hope that if we find patients that have polyps, we can remove them and prevent this, uh, this sequence. Uh, Colleen Schmidt is the president of the ASGE, one of our endoscopic societies this year. And I think the cost of colonoscopy has really come down. I remember when I was in training, I think the cost, just a procedural fee for a colonoscopy was about $1,200. So now Medicare reimburses about $220 for a colonoscopy. And the analogy that she used is that you could go see the Titans versus the Cowboys for two tickets, which are $224. You could probably do that this year because the Titans aren't very good. The Cowboys are pretty good. But the only time I've been in uh, that stadium, I've been on StubHub or begging for tickets outside, and they were a lot more than $224. So apparently, according to Dr. Schmidt, it takes about $300 to whiten your teeth. I haven't had mine done, but maybe I should. Groceries for a family of five is $245. Uh, she made an analogy that if you're in Chattanooga and you want to go bass fishing in Kentucky, that it would cost you $250 for food, and the bass boat to Kentucky for gas would cost you about $246. And then she said a life-saving colonoscopy is about $220. So I think I would agree with that. I think $1,400 for a colonoscopy is kind of steep. I think $220 is probably a fair value. Now, there's been several individuals that have impacted screening for colonoscopy in a very positive way and others that have impacted it in a very negative way over the past 10 to 15 years. So President Reagan, back in 1985, I think, uh, underwent colonoscopy and precancerous polyps were found. He subsequently underwent a colon resection for colon cancer. And it was really in the news, not only because he was our president, but also there was this big issue as who's the commander in chief when he's under sedation. He elected not to give up that power. Uh, you know, I've met more physicians in my lifetime that claim to do Ronald Reagan's colonoscopy than anybody, than anybody else. He's, he's had about 200 doctors do his colonoscopy. Katie Couric has saved a lot more lives uh, from colon cancer than I'll ever hope to. This was uh, back in uh, 1997. Uh, Ms. Kirk's husband was only 42 years old at the time. He was thin, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he was very athletic, and he developed colon cancer and unfortunately died nine months later. So she, as you all are well aware, she underwent, uh, started a lot of these screening campaigns, actually had her colonoscopy done on, uh, on national uh, television. And this was studied by the University of Michigan, and they looked at all the screening colonoscopies that were done before her husband developed colon cancer and, and all of them that were done after. And what they showed was a dramatic rise in the three to five years after she started this campaign for colon cancer. So uh, celebrities can do a whole lot to prove the cause for people that have uh, different medical problems. So if you can still remember, I know it was a long time ago, uh, that I ask you that question, but the 60-year-old obese male uh, that's average risk comes in and declines the screening colonoscopy. So a non-invasive cancer detection test, which requires no bowel prep, would be a stool fit card. So the point of this question is if somebody says, no, I don't want a colon, I don't want anything, you can always offer them a stool fit card, which is, which is still a pretty good option. So let's go through these recommendations quickly. I'm not going to bore you because as you came in, there's a sheet that has all the current recommendations for follow-up on colon polyps, and also this was attached to the announcement uh, for the lecture. So if you're average risk and you come to the office, your options would be a preventative test 
that prevents colon cancer, a preventative test would be colonoscopy at age 50, and if no polyps are found, colonoscopy every 10 years. A cancer detection test, cancer detection test would be an annual stool fit card. And the reason that the VA uses fit cards is just because of the lack of personnel to do the colonoscopies to screen all the veteran population. If the stool fit cards are positive, they're then sent for colonoscopy. African Americans need to be screened at age 45. And th the question remains, if you have extreme smoking or obesity, how do we treat these patients? So there's a great article in this month's gastroenterology by Dr. Lieberman that looks at tailoring endoscopy for patients that have different risk factors. And, and what he came up with is ethnicity is the first thing that you look at. So he looked at Hispanics, whites, and African Americans. Well, obviously, African Americans have the highest instance of colorectal cancer, and they probably ought to be screened at age 40 to 45. Whatever reason, Hispanics have a lower risk factor than African Americans and whites. He found also that patients that had heavy tobacco use and heavy alcohol use, along with a diet that was high in fat, obviously had a much increased risk of having polyps on initial study. So his point was that do we screen these patients earlier, like in their 40s, and not wait till age 50? Well, we probably should, but insurance won't pay for that right now. And also, those aren't the guidelines. And then the final thing he looked at was sex. So if all comers in this room, if you're a male and you're age 50, you have about a 23 to 25% chance of having a precancerous colon polyp at the time of initial colonoscopy. If you're a lady, you have a, about an 18% chance. But more interestingly, what he found was is that women tend to develop their colon polyps at a later age than men. So in his study, looking back at all the colonoscopies that had been performed, the highest rate of polyp formation in women was about age 58. So his point was, do we move screening back for women to their later 50s, move it up for people with risk factors like tobacco smoking, alcohol, and obesity? So I think within the next five years, there'll be better guidelines on, on the above. So if we, if we do have an increased risk in a family history and a first-degree relative, we start at age 40 and every five years for screening the colon. Other high-risk patients include ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis. If we have a patient that has chronic UC or Crohn's uh, after, after 15 years of left-sided colitis or 10 to 12 years of pancolitis, those patients need colonoscopy every one to two years with, with random biopsies every 10 centimeters in a four-quadrant manner. If there's low-grade low dysplasia detected in these patients, they get colectomy if it's confirmed by another pathologist. If there's high-grade dysplasia, they get colectomy. Now, just for test-taking purposes, not that any of us are concerned about taking tests, I'm sure, but uh, uh, familial adenomatous polyposis, this autosomal dominant disease uh, with a germline mutation, APC line lends itself uh, wonderf wonderfully for test taking purposes. You have hundreds of thousands of adenomatous polyps. The risk of cancer is 100% without colectomy, and the mean age of diagnosis is about 39 years old. So we screen these patients by looking for the APC gene. If they have the mutation, we start flexible sigmoidoscopy screening at age 12. If they don't have the mutation, we start at age 25. If the genotype's not available, we start at age 12 and then every few years. Affected individuals, even with colectomy, if they have their anal mucosa intact, need to have their J pouch and their rectum screened about every six months, the J pouch about every one to two years. The other thing that I'm sure um, um, you ought to be aware of is uh, the new Bethesda criteria state that anybody that has a colon malignancy now, that the tumor is analyzed for microsatellite instability by the pathologist on every tumor that's diagnosed. Now, the thing that's typically asked are the extraclonic manifestations of FAP and hereditary non-polyposis coli. There are multiple extraclonic cancers in FAP that involve duodenal, pancreatic, thyroid, and brain. There are extraclonic man manifestations, including stomach, ovary, the ureter, and the biliary tract. And other lesions that pop up oftentimes are these radio-opaque jaw lesions, supernumerary teeth, lipomas, fibromas, and desmoid tumors. You really have to be careful about screening the ampulla 
in these patients. You know, I have several patients that have had several colectomies, and we go back every couple years with a side viewing scope to look at the ampulla of otter because they can get ampullary malignancy and ampullary polyps. I have one patient that had an ampullary cancer. On the tail end of this lecture, you know, what I wanted to discuss is why we fall short a lot of times in screening patients for colon cancer. Why did we think five years ago or seven years ago that if we did a colonoscopy on someone, we had about 100% uh, um, positivity of, of, uh, rate of not having a colon cancer in 10 years, and oftentimes we were, we were proved wrong. So in clinical scenario C, your patient is referred to screening colonoscopy at age 50 to your local gastroenterologist. The study reveals diverticulosis. He told, he's told that he has no worries for the next 10 years. Two years later, he presents with iron deficiency anemia, a positive FIT card with repeat colonoscopy revealing an acidic malignancy. The most like, this most likely arose from a missed tubular adenoma, a missed hyperplastic polyp, a missed villus adenoma, or a missed sessile serrated adenoma. So basically, you do a colon on someone, you tell them they're great for 10 years, Two years later, they have warning symptoms with a positive FIT card. They come back and they're diagnosed with colon cancer. What's the most common cause? Tubular adenoma, hyperplastic polyp, villus adenoma, or a missed sessile serrated adenoma? So we're going to go back to polyps 101. This will just take about two minutes, so don't get too fearful uh, that we're going to spend a lot of time on this. But the, the, the benign polyps that have precancerous or cancer potential include tubular adenomas, tubular villus adenomas, villus adenomas, and the worst actors in the bunch, the sessile serrated adenomas. So these are all the bad guys that if you don't take out of the colon can turn into colon malignancy. Now if you have a polyp, uh, what can happen in that polyp, especially if it's a pre-malignant, pre-cancerous polyp, you can have carcinoma in situ, or you can have intramucosal carcinoma, or you can have invasive carcinoma that spreads through the muscularis mucosa. This can happen in any of these bad actors that we just mentioned. Now, there are polyps that just hang around the colon that aren't bad actors. They can stay there forever, and that, you know, nothing bad is going to happen. And these include hyperplastic polyps, mucosal polyps, juvenile polyps, Hutz-Jaeger's polyps, and inflammatory polyps. So these polyps have no increased risk of malignancy. And if they can hang around the colon for 100 years, and they're going to cause no harm. So a tubular adenoma, if you look at it uh, microscopically, this one's on a nice stalk. And if you, typically, if you look at it um, from higher power, I'm sorry, a lower power, you can see these little tubules in the center. You can see this has a very nice stalk on it. And this is the blood supply and the muscularis running up the center. A villus adenoma uh, has these really pretty, what I think are pretty, these really long, elongated crypts. They're kind of like your fingers if you stuck your fingers up like this, and they're very easy to tell under low power magnification. They're very vertical. They don't go out wide. They're very vertical, and I think that's important to remember when you're trying to distinguish that from sessile serrated adenoma. So villus are very vertical. They stand very erect, not, uh, not wide. Serrated adenomas are the newest players on the block. The pathologists have been talking about these for a very long time. But they've, they've really come about and shown to be very bad actors in the last five years. And again, I, the, histologically, the way you determine this is it has this sawtooth pattern, which is shown at the top of the crypt here, and it's full of mucin. It's these mucin oblate cells all the way through the biopsy. Now, what can happen is these can turn into malignancy. And the analogy I really like is, is the is what happens over time is this almost looks like a tennis racket on the top with the handle here and the head of the racket there. You can have that. Now at the bases, if you remember these crypts uh, in, the, in the villus adenoma were very tall and very vertical. What happens with sessile serrated adenomas is they get very wide and very fat. So they grow at the base and they grow out horizontally. So you have a polyp that's very horizontal that doesn't these nice crypts standing up. And also look at these crypts. They're not vertically oriented. The crypts are in disarray and they're actually going almost sideways. So that's, that's a sessile serrated adenoma. These sessile serrated adenomas are, are, are bad because they follow a different pathway than a typical APC mutation 
that goes on to a KRAS mutation, whereas a lot of tumors uh, follow that path. With this, you have normal mucosa, and in the serrated pathway, you get a BRAF mutation. And when you get this BRAF mutation, you develop a polyp that's full of this foamy mucin with these serrated edges. If you get more promoter methylation after this, then you get a sessile serrated adenoma. Now, the first part of this, the BRAF mutation and the hypermethylation, can be a, a very slow process and a variable process that can take years to occur. But what happens is, once you get that and you get more methylation, you get microsatellite instability, high-grade dysplasia, and colon cancer, the last part of this process, the part over here, can occur very rapidly in this part. And this is very different than the APC uh, pathway for most other polyps. Now, I have way too many pictures of polyps uh, here, but I, I do think it's uh, just to give you a feel for it. We, we use two types of light uh, now when we do endoscopy. We, we use a normal white light, which would be just like looking at a TV monitor with the polyp coming up. And then also, we have narrow band imaging. And with narrow band imaging, what we can do is shine blue light on the polyp. And what happens with the blue light is the blue light is taken up by the blood vessels. And so the, it actually turns polyploid tissue more of a brown color. And so it's easier to pick up. These polyps tend to be on the right side of the colon. They're flat and they're behind folds. But you can see with narrow band imaging, you can see the polyp somewhat better sticking up off the mucosal surface. So this is the serrated adenoma here under white light. Same thing here. Under white light, you see it. It's a little bit harder to see going around corners. And under blue light or narrow band image, you can see it's very well demarcated. The other uh, finding with um, sessile serrated adenomas that's been discussed is a lot of times they have this mucus cap on top of the polyp, and that makes it even more difficult to find. Here's an example of a sessile serrated adenoma in the right colon, which is resected. And you can see the collagen band here at the base of the Bobsy specimen. And there's dysplasia uh, at the top of the specimen. So these, these polyps turn into malignancy a lot quicker than other types of polyps. There's been multiple studies done in the last five years looking at your risk of development of colon cancer after an initial negative screening colonoscopy. And what this is found by several investigators is that your, your relative risk of colon cancer decreases on the left side of the colon after colonoscopy, but you don't get as good of a risk decrease in the right side of the colon after a colonoscopy. But most of these index cancers that occur early after colonoscopy are a result of sessile serrated adenomas detected on initial studies. And the studies and, and colonoscopy as a much better preventative measure for left-sided colon cancers than right-sided colon cancers. So again, don't get too excited about this. I know this is a, is, uh, a lot, but uh, this is on your handout sheet. And actually, when I get my polyp results back, even as long as I've been doing this, I have this posted up uh, by my computer so I can glance at it to make sure I'm following the proper recommendations. So the current recommendations are, if you have no polyps, you would repeat a study in 10 years. Hyperplastic polyps give you no increased potential. That's 10 years. A change that happened in the last couple years is if you have a tubular adenoma, one or two small tubular adenomas, then you can delay repeating that study for 10 years. And that's a change from the previous guidelines. 3 to 10 tubular adenomas is 3 years. Greater than 10 adenomas is less than 3 years. A tubular adenoma greater than a centimeter is three years. One or more villous adenomas is three years. Adenoma with high-grade dysplasia and a serrated lesion is three years. And sessile serrated polyps greater than a centimeter or with dysplasia or traditional serrated adenoma are all three years. So you can see if you fall into a category of having a sessile serrated adenoma, you go to a three-year screening interval. So the answer to our question is this patient most likely had a missed sessile serrated adenoma in the endoscopist that was performing the study. Going to uh, scenario D, um, your patient has a colonoscopy at age 50 and his average risk. Fit positive stool is detected one year later, uh, and the, uh, co the colonoscopy revealed a, a sigmoid colon cancer. 
And the questions asking the endoscopist may have fallen short on which one of these quality measures, a quick withdrawal from the cecum less than six minutes, a poor quality prep, or photo documentation of the cecum. So again, an early cancer that popped up earlier than it should, what, what shortcoming did the endoscopist have? Quick withdrawal time, poor quality prep, photo documentation of the cecum, or all of the above. So there are multiple quality measures that we use in endoscopy now that we, that our fellows use on a daily basis and most, you know, all gastroenterologists should be using. And the highlights of this are, are as follows. Douglas Rex looked at this, and, and what they found was that once you hit the cecum, they need at least six-minute withdrawal time coming out for, vis for proper visualization of polyps. And this six-minute withdrawal time minimal needs to be spent with productive, uh, in a productive manner, you know. And the productive manner is looking behind small folds, washing stool away, focusing on the colon. So that's a productive manner in coming out of a colon. Um, other quality measures include quality of the bowel prep. Uh, you always have to have photo documentation of the, the, of the appendicillar orifice and the ileocecal valve. You, know, you shouldn't look at the abdominal wall and say, well, the light's over here. It's probably in the cecum. Uh, you, other guidelines are making sure that you're following these guidelines for um, uh, a proper follow-up. So any or all of these could have, could have occurred. It could have come out too quick. The prep might have been poor or it may not have been in the cecum. So finally, in the last couple minutes, uh, I just wanted to review a few questions that uh, I'm commonly uh, asked by, uh, by house staff. So, and patients. So what's the best prep for a colonoscopy? Well, there's a real good review the fellows in this month's gastrointestinal endoscopy um, that reviewed uh, uh, prepping, uh, a prep for colonoscopy. And, and the consensus statement was that any split dose prep is really the best prep. So what we encourage our patients to do is to be given the prep, take half the night before, take half the morning of. And if we do this, there's better right-sided visualization. There's also better compliance. Uh, by the patient in ingesting the PrEP. Uh, the next question is, uh, I want to have a colonoscopy. I want Dr. Rinka to do my colonoscopy, but I'm scared to death. I don't want to be put to sleep. Uh, is there any, are there any options? I don't want to feel pain. I don't want to go to sleep. Are there any options for colonoscopy besides that? So there's been, we talked about celebrities at the beginning of the, the lecture that had positive impact on screening colonoscopy. But there's really not a day that goes by in my clinical practice that uh, I'm not asked about tragedies with different uh, uh, celebrities that happen that involve propofol. So the answer to this would be you can have an unsedated procedure. There's been multiple studies looking at unsedated procedures. Uh, uh, the first being uh, a guy I trained with, Wynn Harrison, did one at Mayo. And most patients tolerate an unsedated procedure. Now, the, the million-dollar question is, is that if you find a polyp, is that patient going to come back five years later for a repeat exam? I have to be blatantly honest. If it were me, the answer would probably be no. You know, so I think I want to be dated for my colonoscopy. These studies were done in the VA population. So the, VA, the veterans, as we know, are very, very tough consumers and put up with a lot, but I personally wouldn't want an unsedated. So we don't have to use propofol. We can use fentanyl and we can use Versed. We did studies looking at the protective mechanism protective airway mechanism propofol with uh, fentanyl and Versed. And most people do maintain their protective reflexes when you give them low-dose fentanyl and Versed. And the other answer to this is to use an experienced anesthesia person with propofol. Uh, Diprovan is described as the milk of the gods or the white milk. This is uh, Brian, an iron endoscopy center that's giving propofol. There's two ways to give propofol. One is an IV injection, and when the patient starts to wake up, you give a little bit more by way of IV injection. The other way that they like to give it by the nurse anesthetist at the VA is by a drip, and they're both good ways to do it. But at the end of the day, what you don't want is you don't want somebody that's been working in a heart room for 10 years that doesn't really have a healthy respect for endoscopy, that doesn't really have a lot of experience using propofol because that's when disasters happen about oversedation. The other um, issue with propofol is our, actually our National Society, the ASGE, has come out with a statement saying it's safe for guys like me to give propofol in a lab and still do endoscopy on the patient. And I think that's ludicrous. I think 
you know, your attention ought to be focused on the patient. And the, 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 the pluses and minuses, I'm looking for a new car now, and I'm not doing a very good job of finding one. And so if you look at Motor Trend, it says you'll like this positive, you'll won't like this negative. So the positives about propofol is if you add it, it's the best sedation you'll ever have. When it goes in, you go to sleep. The half-life's very quick. You wake up. You're still not supposed to drive just for medical legal reasons. I bet you could drive if you wanted to. You should feel really good, but you're not supposed to. Very short half-life, very quick turnaround time in the endoscopy center. With fentanyl, my experience with fentanyl is you give fentanyl, they don't get sedated. You give fentanyl, they don't get sedated. Boom, they're sedated, and they won't breathe. And then you're reaching for the Narcan, and they get this diaphragmatic paralysis. The, the problems with propofol is the cost. So uh, we do use anesthesia partners when we use propofol, which drives up the cost of endoscopy. This spring, uh, the insurers are going to start coming up with bundled payments for endoscopy. So the anesthesia people are going to sort out with the endoscopist who gets what part of the reimbursement because five years ago, we really didn't use propofol that much. So you're given one fee for endoscopy. Now there's a fee for the anesthesiologist, a fee for the pathologist, and a fee for the endoscopist. And this is all going to have to be sorted out. The, the, the big risk that everybody worries about is aspiration because it is a deep form of sedation. Aspiration is a very bad thing at the time that it happens. There's increased cost and also you need an a, a anesthesia partner. Next question. Um, do you repeat fit cards yearly after a colonoscopy? So when I send your patient back to you, or Dr. Gwinka sends your patient back to you and says they're good to go for 10 years, the next year in your office, are you going to keep handling these stool fit cards? And my answer is no. Uh, the uh, different states, different societies have stated that if you have a good quality, high quality colonoscopy, that for the next five years, then you really don't need to give this patient stool fit cards. And it's an unnecessary, it drives up the cost. If it's positive and you send them back to me, they're probably going to get another colonoscopy. Now, the negative about this is in my career on three or four different instances, I have had patients had stool hemocult positives a year or two after they were studied. A couple of these were, were studied at the largest centers in the country with high quality, apparent high quality colonoscopies performed. Repeat colonoscopy revealed colon cancer. So there is an Australian study that looked at, do we repeat these cards? What well, is a safety net? Again, when we talk about screening, we talk about mass screening. And to do that with everyone, it just brings up the, up the cost. Final, final uh, uh, question, should I be taking aspirin to prevent colon, poly colon cancer? Uh, there was a recent in August in the Annals of Oncology at the oncology meeting showed that uh, a meta-analysis of this data showed a decrease in colorectal cancer by 30%. Mortality by 40%. This was in every age group and every dose. There was also a smaller benefit with breast, prostate, lung, and endometrial cancer. There was also substantial benefits from gastric cancer. No benefit for pancreatic cancer. The dose, questionable dose, uh, is, is, is still not noted. The harm versus benefit. Aspirin is an independent risk factor for gastrointestinal bleeding, but I still think uh, it's, it's most everyone ought to be on preventative therapy for colon cancer. Other preventative measures, uh, which you all are well aware of, are statin therapy has been shown with a, a decreased risk of colon uh, cancer. The siloxib studies were stopped in patients on follow-up for colon polyps because of the increased risk of cardiovascular events. Um, calcium has been used. Uh, inverse relationships, vitamin D levels, and we already talked about exercise being preventative with high in, high in fat and high in red meat being a promoter. So in summary, um, I hope today uh, that, you, that you have a better understanding on how to stratify your patient risk and follow-up, and you have a copy of the updated guidelines from 2012 on colon polyps. Uh, colonoscopy remains the gold standard for a colon cancer prevention test. Full fit cards are the gold standard for a colon cancer detection test. Sessile serrated adenomas are precursors of 33% of colon cancers and a high proportion of proximal cancers with BRAF mutations. Genetic testing for mismatch repair deficiency is recommended for all newly diagnosed tumors. Quality measures in endoscopy should be utilized. Cost remains a factor in endoscopy, but this ought to be sorted out uh, next spring with bundled payments. 
And if Dervan is used, choose your anesthetist wisely, and the benefits outweigh the harms of aspirin therapy and chemo prevention uh, for polyps and colon cancer. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. I, yeah, so Dr. Dracy's question is very good. You know, we put up those four different societies, radiology, surgeons, this, this, this. At the end of the day, I mean, if you're going to take your boards, I, I can't imagine a question being asked that we didn't cover in this lecture, number one. And number two is the sheet of paper that you have that was developed by Dr. Lieberman and Dr. X and the other societies that came out in 2012 that's on either the ACG website, the ASGE website, and I have it in your hand now. That would be the gold standard, and those were updated a couple years ago. And when I send out my, my letters telling someone their pathology findings, I have that posted on my wall. And, and, and again, on, on for test-taking purposes, you really need to look at the big pictures. Is it an adenoma or not? You know, is it serrated? Serrated adenomas have more proximal missed cancers down the road, those types of things that we discussed about. But that sheet has all that information on it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right, that's, yeah, I didn't, I'm, no, that, that's a great question. So the question was, you have a negative colonoscopy, high quality. We say that you're cleared for 10 years. Do, at what interval do you repeat stool fit cards or you don't repeat stool fit cards? My personal preference would be if they aren't iron deficient or have warning symptoms that you don't ever repeat a fit card for another 10 years. The current guidelines would say that you're 100% okay for the first five years on, if you do it the first five years, you're wrong. You shouldn't have repeated a fit card, okay? After five to 10 years, nobody can say that you're wrong for doing it, and that's grayer, but in my, in my practice, what I tell my referring doctors is just don't repeat them for 10 years. But you're, you're wrong if you do it the first five years think you're wrong, the studies show you're wrong. But after five to ten years, if you're just kind of a, you know, more information, you could do that, but I don't think it's necessary. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Patients who have early stage colon cancer, so study on the test. Yes. Do we have guidelines to see how often you do a PCR of the primary malignancy? Yes. How often do you do the That's a great question because there was a lot of, Dr. Christian, question was, if, if, if you're diagnosed with colon cancer, and uh, at what interval do you repeat the study? So there, there's two answers to that. One is obviously, I mean, and, and you know this, but just for the students, if you have an obstructing cancer and you can't get all the way around the colon and you can just look at the left side of the colon, the malignancy needs to be resected. After the malignancy is resected, you, at, you, in the perioperative period, you need a full colonoscopy immediately for any synchronous lesions in the right colon. There was discrepancy between the surgical literature and the GI literature. The GI literature saying if you had a full colonoscopy at the diagnosis of the colon cancer, that you could wait three to five years to repeat that study. The consensus between the surgical societies and GI societies now is that one year after diagnosis of that colon cancer, even if you got around the colon, you need another colonoscopy. So I typically survey in one year after, the, after that diagnosis. And some people would say you can go to five years after that. I would tend to go to three years and then to five years after that study. But you definitely need one one year after the diagnosis. Any other questions? Thank you for your time. I hope you got something with me. So I got them, I got them, I've been telling them all morning. We got you coming to give this great lecture. Oh my God. <laughs>